All right, it, it seems from, the, from the, the buzz out there that uh, people are enjoying this session so far. Uh, and uh, so we got more. Uh, you know, we were just in the Pacific, uh, and, and now we're going to return to the European theater to take a look at the Eastern Front. Uh, we know there's great interest amongst our museum visitors and conference attendees on the Eastern Front. You know, so this promises to be a, another fascinating conversation. Of course, with the ongoing war in Ukraine, uh, really it points to the enduring relevance of this topic as well. Yes, uh, today this features the museum's own Samuel Murray Stone senior historian, Dr. Rob Satino. And uh, Dr. Alexander Ritchie, one of the museum's presidential counselors. and a professor from the Collegium Civitas University in Warsaw. Now, Rob and uh, Alex uh, will explore what resistance against two forces, uh, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, looked like on the ground in the USSR and in Poland during World War II in a session uh, entitled Between Hitler and Stalin. Now, joining them as the chair is, is our own Jenny Craig Institute's Leventhal Research Fellow, Dr. Jen Popowitz. Uh, Jen received her PhD from Louisiana State University in 2021, and she's a specialist in the history of Ukrainian nationalism, forced labor, and war in society in the Second World War. Her work has been supported by a number of fellowships, including the International Ukrainian Summer School and the Auschwitz Jewish Center. So with that, uh, Jen, I'll hand it over to you. Good luck. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Um, I'm happy to be chairing this panel um, entitled Between Hitler and Stalin on the Eastern Front, which will look at some of the lesser known aspects of resistance on the Eastern Front. Um, I'm gonna briefly introduce our speakers and I'll do that in the order they'll present and then I'll turn it over um, to them and we'll have a brief round table like our last two sessions and then we'll turn um, it over to the audience for Q&A. So first, um, as Mike said, we have our very own um, Dr. Rob Satino, who is the Samuel Zamuri Stone Senior Historian in the Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. Uh, Dr. Satino is an award-winning military historian and scholar who has published 10 books, including The Wehrmacht Retreats, Fighting a Lost War, 1943, Death of the Wehrmacht, The German Campaigns of 1942, and The German Way of War, From the Thirty Years' War to the Third Reich and numerous articles covering World War II and 20th century military history. This presentation today is entitled Resistance on the Eastern Front, Thoughts on Collaboration, and will address the relatively less known topic of Soviet partisans who decided to take up arms against the Soviet Union and fight alongside the Germans. Our second speaker is another good friend of the museum, Alexander Ritchie, who is a presidential counselor here at the National World War II Museum. She is a historian of German and Central and Eastern Europe and specializes in defense and security issues. She is the author of Boss Metropolis, A History of Berlin and Warsaw 1944, Hitler, Himmler and the Warsaw Uprising. She has also appeared in several documentaries, radio and television programs. Today she will be speaking about why it was the Poles created the largest and most effective underground resistance in occupied Europe where this movement came from and how it became so successful. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rob Satino. Thank you so much, Jen. It's uh, really good to see everyone again. Um, we reconvened last year, you know, but a lot of people couldn't come last year. I'm seeing people today that I haven't seen for a couple of years. There's been, I've been hearing about my son's gotten married. I'm a grandparent. Uh, there's been losses in the family and it's, you know, we always say we're getting the band back together, but this is really more, this is more like a family gathering and it is really, really good to, to be again with, with all of you. So um, I, I'm going to talk about resistance on the Eastern Front as, uh, as Jen just told you, but I'm going to do so in a kind of typically twisted way. Um, I, I'm not sure there's any part of the, the war in the East that has been more subject to mythologizing than the Soviet partisan movement. And the mythology goes something like this. Um, Operation Barbarossa, you all know the German invasion of the Soviet Union, united the peoples of the USSR as never before. They flocked to, to defend the Soviet motherland from the fascists, even as the German Wehrmacht was crashing over the border, driving on Leningrad, Kiev, and Moscow. 
independent partisan bands were already uh, springing up behind their lines. Thousands of, of Soviet civilians, hundreds of thousands, men and women fighting side by side, willing to die to free their beloved homeland from the invader. And, and so the story goes, you've all heard it, within a few short months, they, they, had ruled, they were ruling the countryside, making life hell for the Germans, turning supposedly safe rear areas into a danger zone, the partisans lying in ambush, sniping and slitting throats. Death seemed to be lurking around every corner, and for the ordinary Lanzer, uh, the, the Wehrmacht's equivalent of G.I. Joe, service on the, Western, uh, on the uh, Russian front came to look more and more like a death sentence. But, but, but of course, you, you all know this already from watching Hogan's Heroes. Um, <laughs> you know, Schultz acts up and Klink threatens to send Schultz to the Russian front, then Schultz trembles, and, or Burkhalter does it to Klink. I, I could go on and on, but I probably shouldn't. <laughs> You know, it's a great, it's a great story, and, and, and it, it's inspiring, it's, it's uplifting, uh, it, it, it has that, that irresistible sense of individuals rising up to defend their own freedom. And, and the best part is that some of that story is even true. Uh, by, by the middle period of the war, certainly, uh, when I, by which I mean 1943, 1944, the partisans had become a serious problem for the Germans. So I've studied uh, the, the battles around Oryol in August of 1943, and then the great Soviet uh, Belarusian offensive of June 1944, Operation Bagration. I've studied those in some detail in the course of my career. Uh, the conclusions are inescapable. The, the partisans were laying down a massive hurt on the Wehrmacht by this point in the war. They were waging a very successful campaign, not so much of slitting throats in the rear areas, but of, of railway demolitions that materially degraded German logistics, and, and, and which played a, a key role in those Soviet victories. There's a memoir by the German uh, railroad, railroad chief of Army Group Center in 1944, and it details just how many demolitions there were the night before the kickoff of those offenses, that it's in the tens of thousands. And sure, you can fix, you can fix them all, but they, it takes time and there's delay and everything is, uh, your, your troops, are, your defenders or reserves are rushing to the front a little more slowly and supplies are arriving a little more slowly. And there's no doubt that the partisans played a role in, in those Soviet victories. But at the same time, however, that, that sort of mythology I just took you through, we need to admit that much of it, uh, much of that mythology on the partisans is just that. And in fact, it was first written by Soviet propagandists during the war. It was echoed after the war by Western historians. And you know what's happened now, it's been firmly ensconced as true in, in many people's minds. Um, my daughter always does her, her air quotes backwards. And sometimes I'll do that. So if you see what I'm doing, I'm not having a, I'm not having a seizure up there. I want you to know that. Um, <laughs> So, so what I'd like to do in the course of these brief remarks is deconstruct that myth a bit, separating fact not so much from fiction, because the, there was a Soviet partisan movement and a very successful one eventually, and played a role. So not separating fact from fiction, but separating fact wherever we can from embellishment. And I think if we've achieved that, I think, I think these, these remarks will have been uh, worthwhile. So um, I, I think we can start with the notion that partisans were mainly civilians. Well, hardly. The, the, the principal recruiting source for partisan units in the Soviet Union was the Red Army. Individuals, or sometimes entire units, who had been broken in battle, but who had managed to evade being encircled and taken prisoner by the Germans, or who had managed to break out of a weakly held encirclement. The, the, the German operational scheme in the Soviet Union was to smash whatever military unit they came across, to render it ineffective, and then to move on and do it again. It was not to seal up tight encirclements and take every last Soviet uh, soldier prisoner. And in fact, it came nowhere close to doing that. So most partisans were still in some sort of uniform and under someone's military command, a, a battalion or company commander, a non-com, a staff officer, a local communist commissar or cadre. So, so rather than the spontaneous civilian uprising inspired by Soviet patriotism, the partisans were really the remnants of Red Army version 1.0, the force that was smashed by the Germans in the opening campaign. Smashed, yes, but certainly not annihilated, destroyed, or wiped out to the last man, not even close. <laughs> 
and about that Soviet patriotism that motivated the partisans. As, as many of you know, I don't know, we're speaking to an expert audience here, Alex, I always have to remember that. <laughs> don't have to explain everything. As many of you know, one of the first things the Stalinist regime did after being invaded was to put the Marxism on hold in its official propaganda and pronouncements in, in favor of a much more traditional form of Russian nationalism. Uh, apparently, uh, Stalin and the, uh, his, his minions in the Kremlin you know, uh, fasten on to an obvious fact to most of us that patriotism was a better motivating force to get men to fight than communism was. Religion, too, made a comeback of sorts in this official Soviet, uh, atheist Soviet Union. Churches reopened, and it is possible to see photos of Orthodox priests or bishops uh, blessing Red Army units about to ride off to battle. And, and, and finally, the, the, the Soviet people rising up as one against the invader. This is without doubt the most laughable part in the entire partisan mythology. There, there certainly was a spontaneous popular movement on the, in the Eastern Front, but it wasn't exactly what Soviet propaganda would have had the world believe. Uh, rather, it was citizens of the Soviet Union rising up to overthrow Soviet rule, to work with the invading Germans. Now, uh, th this, could, this could be a talk all by itself. In, in 15 minutes, we'll do what we can. But we, we can start with the, the hundreds of thousands of volunteers from the Baltic states, Estonia and Latvia especially, who joined the, the armed SS units on the Eastern Front, the so-called Waffen SS. These were the so-called Baltic legions, the 1st Estonian Division and the 1st and 2nd Latvian Division. So you're looking at roughly 60 or 70,000 men in those three units. And there's other smaller police units. You, you add it all up, you're probably getting over 100,000 uh, uh, men from the, from the Baltic states. Now, they had only been Soviet since 1940. So the Soviet, as part of the Nazi Soviet pact, the Baltic states had fallen to Stalin, and, and Stalin moved to pick up that chit after the Polish campaign. And so they had, they had been Soviet territory for a very, very small time, but nevertheless, uh, they, uh, they, these were Soviet territories that were now more or less an open revolt against Stalinist rule. There were volunteers from Ukraine, many, many volunteers from Ukraine, operating as so-called Shupo units, uh, Schutzpolizei, auxiliary police, and then later, as the Ukrainian insurgent army uh, in, in Ukrainian, you, it looks to us like UPA, uh, around 100,000 men probably in the Ukrainian insurgent army. They fought behind Soviet lines, carrying out ambushes, disrupting communications and supply. In February 1944, they, they landed big game. They killed the commander of the Soviet first Ukrainian front, General uh, N.F. Vatutin. Uh, now, now, lest we give the wrong impression, you, I, I hear what you're saying. You're skeptical. You're saying, well, Rob, those the Baltic states had only been Soviet for a very brief time, and the Ukrainians, they've, of course, they've, they've objected to rule from Moscow for quite some time. So lest I give the wrong impression, it wasn't just non-Russian nationalities. There was a Russian Liberation Army under General A. A. Vlasov, uh, an officer captured in the fighting near Leningrad. That's so-called Vlasov Army as it's usually called in the literature, uh, was more like a core-sized formation, oversized core, probably mm, a little less than 100,000 men at its, at its largest. But that's not to mention the 750,000 to 1 million auxiliary volunteers in German, Hilsviliger, sometimes Hivis, H-I-W-I-S, Soviet citizens who formed the backbone of the Wehrmacht support and supply services in the occupied Soviet Union. They carried out police duties. They fought alongside the Wehrmacht on occasions too numerous to mention. So we're starting to add, if you're, if you're keeping tally here, the numbers are starting to add up. The Caucasus region, one of the main targets of the Wehrmacht's 1942 campaign, was an especially fertile recruiting ground for the Germans. Uh, the, the, the Wehrmacht or, or SS organized a Georgian legion of 12 battalions, an Armenian legion of another 11 battalions, a Turkestan legion, eight battalions of Central Asian troops, uh, Turkmen, Uzbeks, Kazakhs, Tajiks, Kyrgyz, the, from the, as we call them today, from the stands. Uh, perhaps most dramatically, out on the remote Kalmyk steppe by the Caspian Sea, virtually the entire population of ethnic Kalmyks 
went over en masse to the Germans, forming a Kalmyk cavalry corps of, of more than 5,000 horsemen, one of the largest cat horse cavalry formations to be found anywhere in, in World War II. Um, finally, those of you conversant in the Normandy and Italian campaigns, and you know that means everyone in this room, um, <laughs> you know that tens of thousands of supposedly German troops fighting in France and Italy weren't German at all. They were so-called Osttruppen, Eastern troops recruited from the ranks of Soviet POWs. So you add all that up, I'm notoriously bad at math, uh, but you get at least 1.5 million citizens of the USSR fighting for Hitler, to put it in its briefest form. Now that's a small percentage of the Soviet population of 170 million, I grant you, of course it is. But a million and a half people still add up to something and those one and a half million definitely played a role in the fighting. Again, I've gone pretty deeply into the sources on this, and after the Stalingrad disaster, that, that, Soviet, that foreign Soviet manpower was one of the key factors that kept the Eastern Front from collapsing altogether. Now, wartime Soviet, the wartime and post-war Soviet propaganda condemned all million and a half or two billion of them as traitors and fascists, lumping them, them under the general heading of collaborators. They were put on trial, they were declared insane, they were executed wholesale, they were thrown down the Stalinist memory hall for good. Their very existence couldn't be denied because it had been too widespread, so it had to be belittled. The official line was that everyone had been on board in the Great Patriotic War. Every sane and good Soviet citizen, in other words, uh, Exhibit A, fiery Soviet journalist Ilya Ehrenberg, who wrote, who wrote, there isn't a single solitary Russian who would support the Germans. I mean, his claim was patently absurd, as about two-thirds of the words that Ehrenberg wrote in his career, frankly. Uh, but, but given the logic of Stalin's rule, um, they were predictable. Strictly speaking, there was not, and could not be, any opposition within the Stalinist system, just as there could be no errors in Stalin's handling of the war. So what or who were these resistors then if they weren't uh, evil collaborators or, or uh, insane? You know, certainly some were fascists and anti-Semites, homegrown Nazis who followed Hitler out of ideological motives because they believed in his mission. There's no doubt about that. Others were nationalists and patriots fighting to liberate their homelands from, from Soviet uh, Russian rule or Stalinist tyranny, take your pick, or to guarantee their land some preferential treatment in a German-ruled Europe, which for a time it looked like what we were all were going to have to be living with. Others were POWs seeking to get a better deal from their German captors. Some were adventurers swept up in the moment. Probably all of them were all of these things. And the motives and the precise mix are as varied as the number of individuals involved. Painting them all as collaborators, in other words, just doesn't suffice, doesn't seem nuanced enough uh, to be helpful. And, and while I'll eschew much in the way of detail today, happy to discuss it in the, in the Q&A, suffice it to say that many of these anti-Soviet fighters have been rehabilitated by the newly independent successor states after the fall of the Soviet Union in December of 1991. That's the entire basis for the memory wars, uh, plugged for a memory conference, uh, in Eastern Europe today, just what is permitted and what isn't. Who gets a statue and who has their statue torn down? I mean, what if a local freedom fighter, which is, you know, fist pump, leading resistance against the Red Army, second fist pump, what if he once professed his admiration for Adolf Hitler? I mean, consider a figure like Stepan Bandera. I'll be done in about a minute and a half, I think. Yeah. Consider a figure like Stepan Bandera in, the, in, in Ukraine. Uh, before the war, his group, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, was assassinating uh, Polish and Soviet officials alike for the cause of an independent Ukraine. He was also an integral nationalist who wanted foreigners expelled from Ukraine. Now, that could mean many things in Ukraine, but one of the things it definitely meant was uh, expelling the large Jewish population of Ukraine. When the Germans invaded the Soviet Union, Bandera raised troops to fight alongside the Wehrmacht. His Nachtigall, the Nightingale in German battalion, were among the first German troops to enter Lviv, the big Ukrainian city, on June 29th, just a week, be, a week into the invasion. Uh, when that same unit took part in the proclamation of Ukrainian independence, the very next day, he was arrested and eventually wound up in Sachsenhausen concentration camp. Two of his brothers died in Auschwitz. Some of his followers were fighting uh, against the Germans. 
others were helping to round up and kill Jews in the Ukraine as part of Hitler's racial project. You know, Bandera sounds kind of mercurial, but he was actually quite consistent every step of the way. I don't think he changed at all. I don't think he changed his beliefs at all about anything. So how do we deal with someone like that? I mean, it's gonna take someone smarter than I am and probably another century or so to answer that one, I think, in any kind of satisfactory way. You know, I've, I've been, since I've been speaking at the International Conference since 2012, and we're always told, don't get too, don't take, get too heavy at the International Conference. We, we, we wanna get through our material and get, and get on a bit, but let me, let me get heavy for a moment. I, I have to say this whole subject may be especially difficult for Americans, for us Americans to parse. We are what the ancient world would call Manichaeans. <laughs> We like, we, we wanna see everything through a lens of good and evil, black and white. There are no shades of gray or ambiguity. We, we don't deal well with those kinds of concepts. We are especially prone to do that in our analysis of World War II. But if the bloodlands of Eastern Europe in World War II were anything, they were the realm of the ambiguous, where one was faced with nearly impossible choices every day that made it very difficult to stay on a kind of tight moral compass or a tight moral line. I'll end my remarks this morning with one thought, which I hope we can all agree with. If one and a half million people decide to do anything, then the phenomenon is probably worth a closer look than it's gotten up till now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob, and now I'll turn it over to Alex. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna see if there we go. Um, I'm gonna talk about the Polish resistance, and I'm happy to say that it gets a lot less murky in Poland, because uh, it's a pretty straightforward thing. The most famous uh, manifestations of resistance in Poland, the war, were things like the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the Warsaw Uprising, the uprisings in places like Treblinka, Sobibor, which are relatively well known. So I'm gonna start with uh, a kind of a, a more general question. Why was Poland, why was the resistance in Poland so successful, so widespread? And by the end of the war, at least 360,000 members of the AK, and these weren't the AK's Army of Krajowa, the home army, um, who owed its allegiance to the uh, government in exile in London. But these weren't just people who said, you know, I want to be part of the resistance. You know, they had to be vetted. They had special uh, you know, codes, names. They, they, they couldn't just, you couldn't just join. So this was a tremendous and profound uh, resistance movement, uh, which really touched all of Poland and all Poles, both Polish Jews and <coughs> Polish Catholics, for different reasons in different ways. And one of the reasons was the sheer brutality of the war. First of September 1939, the Germans invade, of course, as we all know. Um, and it was obvious this was going to be a new kind of war targeted against civilians from the beginning. Uh, the Poles fought valiantly. There's all sorts of nonsense about, you know, Polish cavalry attacking tanks, and they weren't that <laughs> stupid. Uh, and uh, and uh, so that's sort of thankfully been debunked somewhat. But um, the Poles did fight very well, but they, of course, were outnumbered, outgunned by the Germans. And then, uh, on the 17th of September, uh, the Soviets invade from the from the east, uh, thanks to the secret protocol of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Um, and, and in both zones, crimes against civilians began immediately. Um, all traces of Polish rule in the Soviet zone were to be erased. The NKVD was set, sent out, and by the way, they were far more efficient than the Gestapo and the SS in terms of digging out supposed or real enemies of, of the Soviet uh, rule. Uh, and over a million Poles ended up being deported to the Soviet Union. Uh, the fate of many of them is still unknown. We do know about, for example, 20,000 or so uh, Polish officers in uniform who were killed at Katyn. It's a totally disgraceful crime. Uh, one does not go and murder officers in uniform, uh, prisoners of war. Um, and there was a short respite at Barbarossa when Stalin let uh, uh, some hundreds of thousands of these people go, and they became part of the Anders Army that went down then through Iraq and into eventually into Italy. Uh, but it was a pretty sorry state of affairs. Um, it was in the German section, really, that a really new type of warfare was, was tested. Just a week before the invasion, Hitler told his senior commanders he had the intention to murder, and I quote, without pity or mercy, all men, women, and children of Polish descent or language in a war of conquest and annihilation. Conquest and annihilation. Himmler drew up special lists of people who were going to be targeted and arrested and killed, both by the Einsatzgruppen, the special units that were specifically uh, developed to kill civilians, but others as well. Uh, and uh, from the spring of 1939 to the spring of 1940 alone, some 60,000 people were rounded up and, and killed. This slide is a, uh, oh, where is it gone? Um, this slide is a picture of, 
There we go. Uh, you can see a, a woman war correspondent uh, with the um, uh, members of the 14th Army Corps of the Wehrmacht. Uh, they've just been busy killing 13 Jews and Polish Catholics in a mass slaughter at the town of Konski on September 10th, 1939. And the woman in the picture is Leni Riefenstahl. Yeah. Uh, so it, it gives you some sense of, okay, she re, re, you can look at both, all of their faces. It's, it's an incredible photograph in my view. Uh, she later recovers, she goes and sits at Hitler's feet when he takes over Gdansk. He then, she then, then does the filming of Hitler's um, uh, victory parade in Warsaw, but it's a fascinating uh, photograph. Um, the Nazis wanted to basically eliminate Poland as a, as a nation, as, as a state. And resistance started immediately during the invasion. Um, uh, for example, uh, General Bor Komorowski, who later leads the Warsaw Uprising, uh, was going to go and join his fellow soldiers trying to get to France so they could carry on the fight from France and eventually the UK, <laughs> and many, many did. But he was in Krakow at the time, and he watched a gigantic swastika flag being raised over the Wawel Castle, the great symbol of, of Polish national identity. And he decided at that moment, no, he's not going to leave. He's going to stay in the country and fight from Poland itself. And many, many tens of thousands, of, of, of course, did uh, do this. And they came eventually under the uh, umbrella of what became the Army of Krajowa, the AK. Why? Well, one reason was, was sheer patriotism. This was a young, the so-called Columbus generation. Most of the people fighting, we heard about the Philippines, uh, people in their, in their teens and, and 20s, uh, determined not to lose their country after it had been disappeared off the map for 123 years. Um, there are parallels with Ukraine now. I, I have interviewed hundreds of people who were in the resistance in, in Poland uh, during the war, and they all said the same thing. You know, we would die for our country, and I would sort of go, Let's die for your country. Now I've seen it first hand with Ukrainian students of mine who've given up their studies in my university to go back to Ukraine to fight because they say we are not going to live under Russia again. And it's something that I, this is the first time I've felt this firsthand, and it's quite, quite moving. Another reason for the fact that Poles, generally speaking, didn't collaborate, there's always collaboration in every army and every, every country, but generally speaking, this was not the case in Poland. One was also Hitler's racial pecking order. You know, the Jews were eventually to be completely exterminated, the Poles were to be eliminated largely or enslaved. Uh, there was no, not to be a Quisling in Poland. There were not going to be SS Galicia divisions or, or so on, because the, the, the Poles, uh, and of course the Jews, were ethnically not suitable for this. So before long, a number of important bodies emerged. Of course, very soon the Jews were quickly pushed into ghettos, deliberately separated from the rest of Polish society by the Nazis. This was deliberate, not just in Poland, but all over the occupied territories. Uh, and they, and, but Polish resistance, Polish Jewish resistance began in those ghettos through various forms. Uh, one was things like the Ringelblum archive, where Ringelblum and his colleagues gathered everything they could to show what life was like under Nazi occupation. Uh, and then, of course, there was the creation of the Polish uh, Jewish fighting organizations like uh, Zob, ZOB, or ZZW, which eventually would lead the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. On the Polish uh, Catholic, or the Polish uh, um, uh, uh, sort of non-Jewish Poles, uh, including Polish Catholics and other Christians, uh, they created a, an underground state, which was in itself an extraordinary feat, um, because the Poles simply refused to accept that the Germans had taken over their country. Uh, and so uh, they behaved, they reverted to type, um, and countries that have a history of being uh, dominated by others, uh, tend to have this in their DNA anyway. So the Polish nation was, was divided by the Prussians, the Russians, and the Austrians in 1772, uh, and they created this under, these underground worlds. The Prussians and uh, Russians said, you can't speak the Polish language. The Poles did, secretly, et cetera, et cetera. And they did the same thing under Nazi occupation. They created a state with their own schools and own government in exile and uh, court systems and universities and a police force and a medical force, civilian aid, all these things done in great danger under the noses of the Germans. Um, and of course, there was a military aspect of this as well, a Polish home army, the AK, as I've already mentioned, uh, and they started to resist as soon as the war began. But the big problem was that there was never a shortage of Poles who were willing to fight the Germans, even lose their lives, but the big problem was retaliation. So one of the first uh, uh, incidences of, of um, uh, a German, uh, Polish group under Henryk Dobranski who attacked uh, some Germans, uh, the enraged Germans formed, formed a special squad and 700 local villagers in the area that he attacked were, were killed. And this was the sort of thing that just happened constantly. 
The Poles came up with other alternatives, things like mass graffiti drives, uh, you know, changing German posters to have a totally different message. Uh, candles were lit secretly at places of mass execution. The Poles published over 200,000 copies of secret underground uh, newspapers every day all over Poland. Uh, there were uh, the elite Kedef unit, for example, went out, blew up locomotives and so on. Over uh, 7,000 locomotives were damaged in this way. Uh, uh, artillery shells being made were deliberately sabotaged. They sabotaged over 5,000 air aircraft that were being made in factories stationed in, in Poland and so on. But sometimes uh, the Poles realized that even though they knew there was going to be retaliation, they would nevertheless have to step up and, and, and kill some of these Germans. One of these operations was called Operation Heads, and they actually went and, and identified uh, through their court system, it was all done actually under trial system in, in underground Poland, and between 1942 and 44 uh, alone, there had been about 400 victims daily of the Germans killing Poles on the streets and so on. They decided that they had to stop this. Uh, and, uh, and the Home Army uh, then targeted uh, the Gendarme, for example, 360 were killed in 1943, 584 in 1944. They launched 87 attacks on top um, German administrators. Frank Berkel, the commandant of the infamous Paviak prison in Warsaw, was assassinated. So was uh, Frank Kuchera, who was the police leader in, SS police leader in Warsaw, in a very daring uh, assassination attempt, which was very similar to the one against Heydrich. Uh, Heydrich, of course, was more infamous, but Kuchera was a particularly vile SS leader. And with his assassination, actually, despite the fact that there were huge retaliations, the number of these random roundups and murders in Warsaw um, uh, redu were reduced. But looking at the Polish resistance from a historical point of view, perhaps the most important was actually intelligence. Uh, the, the, there, there are a number, many, many, many dozens of examples of this. I'll mention just a couple. One was getting the uh, Enigma codes. Um, the Enigma, the, the Germans, uh, the Polish cipher organization that was recreated in 1919, started realizing in, in 1923 that there were these new strange German codes. And uh, the cipher section, the head of the cipher section, Captain Chensky, came up to the idea that you might break the Enigma code not linguistically, but mathematically. And so he hired, um, oops, he hired these uh, three Polish, um, oops, that's not working. Uh, three Polish mathematicians, very famous mathematicians, um, who worked on the interconnection between the rotors and so on. It's far too complex for me, but created <laughs> these things called bombas. Uh, and 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 then they, they they knew because of the fact that they were encrypting uh, decrypting uh, German codes that the Germans were going to invade, and they invited. Uh, the French and English uh, representatives, uh, Gustave Bertrand and the British counter, Alistair Denison, to come and collect all of this information that they gathered on the, on the um, Enigma codes, gave it to them, and of course this ended up uh, in France and then at Bletchley Park, allowing Alan Turing to, to build his Colossus machine. There was absolutely no mention of the Polish um, Polish contribution until very recently. Now there's a lovely huge plaque, uh, and Alan Turing always, uh, always uh, conceded that the Poles had done an enormous amount to help, but uh, it was, of course, lost in the Cold War. Another example was getting the uh, V-2 rocket. Uh, incredible. I mean, one of the most daring do operations in the war. Uh, the Akal were watching all these test sites and, and operations around the V-2 uh, facilities, and on April, in April 1944, a test rocket fell near the Anarchy uh, village, near the Bug River. The Akal were ready. They raced out. They found it. They covered it with mud and grass and stuff. The Germans, of course, came out looking for it, couldn't find it, and they finally said, well, I guess it fell into the marshes or whatever else. The Aka on the night of 25th July 1944, Dakota, from the 267th Squadron, play, flew all the way from Brindisi, landed in this Army Cryova outpost uh, right by the rocket uh, in the village of Motil. A V-2 was loaded onto the plane in pieces, flown back to Brindisi, and brought to the UK, where, of course, the, the scientists in, in Britain could take it apart and start to figure out what this V-2 rocket was. And there were many, many dozens of other operations. The Chicho Chemli, the, the silent and unseen, uh, dropped, uh, were trained by the SOE, men and women, uh, dropped into 
Poland carrying you know, microfilm weapons, uh, information, money to pay for the other underground organizations, and other intelligence work, like the famous couriers like Jan Karski, who crossed uh, Europe um, and, and finally, in fact, ended up in Washington trying to tell Roosevelt and others about the realities of the Holocaust. He'd famously uh, been smuggled into the Warsaw Ghetto and a subcamp of uh, Belzec, and uh, others too, uh, like Witold Pilecki, who got smuggled into Auschwitz to try and figure out what that camp was all about. I mentioned that the most famous things were the, were the uprisings, the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. I had the great good fortune to meet uh, Marek Edelman, who was the last surviving um, um, member of, of Zub, the Polish uh, commander of Zub, the Polish um, uh, Jewish fighting organization. And he said that we started the uprising because we knew we would not win it, but we wanted to choose the time and place of our death to so not have that determined by the Germans. And so they died, and you know, 53,000 of them or so died in the uprising. But but uh, a tremendously noble uh, operation, which the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum calls one of the most significant occurrences in the history of the Jewish people. And this very much inspired the Warsaw Uprising the following year, 1st of August 1944, um, which uh, was really an attempt by the Poles, who by this time realized that Stalin intended to Sovietize Poland, to try and kick the Germans out of Warsaw and welcome the Soviets in as, as, as a liberating, fellow liberating force in the, in the hope that this would somehow allow for a kind of Polish freedom. Well, it was, a, it was not to be. Uh, and unfortunately, this is what happened. Uh, the Germans um, uh, came back in force, uh, killed about 200,000 civilians. Uh, 100,000 or so, once the capitulation happened, were taken as slave laborers to the Reich, the last big input for Albert Speer and others into slave labor. About 20,000 were sent to various camps, including Auschwitz. Uh, and uh, and uh, the, the city was then systematically looted and then uh, bombed, and to, so almost nothing remained. Um, so the, uh, the, the uprising, both the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was tragic for one set of reasons, the Warsaw Uprising for another. Um, but nevertheless, that uh, the tragedy generally for Poland was that despite all of its resistance, it ended up trading one dictatorship for another. But having now lived in Poland for a quite a number of years, I have to say that uh, there's one thing that's absolutely certainly true about the Poles, which is uh, they really do believe, deeply believe, that freedom is worth fighting for, and indeed freedom is worth dying for. And they really did show it in World War II. Thanks very much. Very nice. Thank you both for so um, two amazing presentations that I think gave our audience a look at some of the lesser known aspects of resistance um, on the Eastern Front. Um, we're going to start our roundtable portion, and I have a question for each of you, and then I have an overarching question to kind of wrap up, and then we can turn it over to the audience for their questions. Um, so, Rob, I'll start with you. Um, you mentioned that. The Soviet or the Soviet partisans that were fighting with Nazi Germany came from a wide range of nationalities. Um, so my question is, how did this play out in the actual operational fighting against Germany? Uh, well, sure. Since there were different, obviously different goals that each group had. Yeah, it's a really good question, and, and it, it shows the complexity of this topic. First of all, there's the language issue. It's all well and good to say, well, we have an Estonian division fighting alongside us. <laughs> exactly. How many Estonian speakers do we have on staff? Um, and the answer is not many. Uh, same, same thing with Latvians. And, and of course, all the nationalities of the, of the Soviet Union, you'd have you know, pretty much the same problem. But, but I think more than that, I mean, we've been dealing with that question for a long time. The Habsburg Empire dealt with it for 500 years and usually fairly successfully. But I think you've gone beyond the, just the linguistics gen to the political side, that each one of these groups, each one of these resistors that, that, that wanted to overthrow Stalinism, they probably had a different vision for exactly what they wanted Stalinism replaced by. So in, in, the, in the course of the, um, in the case of the Baltic states, th that's fairly simple. Th they, they wanted independent uh, Latvia and Estonia back. Now, th there's, that's not a long history. They got their independence in the, at the end of World War uh, I, so let us say by 1920. So they'd been going concerns for precisely two decades. And, and so th there were structures in place, there were elections, there was a bureaucracy. You, you, you could return to something like pre-war Latvia. You could do that. 
Uh, but even amongst the Latvians, what, what kind of Latvia would that be? Was it going to be a parliamentary democracy? Parliamentary democracy was clearly played out by now on the world stage. This great conflict between fascism and, and Stalinist communism is, is the, the backdrop for all this. And so there might be some, some who wanted a parliamentary democratic Latvia, others who wanted a Latvia that had been ethnically cleansed of all non-Latvians and especially Jews. And, and the same thing can be said, I think, to a lesser extent in, um, uh, in Estonia. Lithuania, which I haven't mentioned much, there certainly were resistor, resistance on both sides, against the Soviets, against the incoming Germans, back against the Soviets when, when, when they uh, came in. But not as much a more rural population, perhaps, and, and thus not as really involved politically, I guess we might say, of, of, of some of the more advanced neighbors to the, to the north. But so, so what kind of Ukraine do we want? I mean, there's a good question. There hasn't been a Ukraine for a long time in 1940. Uh, there had been one very briefly at the end of World War I, but by which I mean an independent, politically independent Ukraine. Clearly, there's a Ukrainian nation, but nation does not mean state. The two are not the same thing. There's, una there's a nation. We speak Ukrainian. We have Ukrainian national heroes. We partake of Ukrainian culture. We feel ourselves part of that group. Uh, but what kind of U Ukraine? Do you want? Well, how about Belarus, now called Belarus, universally at the time, Belarusia? There, there were anti Soviet and anti Nazi resistors, but, 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 so on both sides in Belarusia, but as far as I know, there had never been an independent Belarusia. I, I maybe, maybe we could find some time in, in history where, where we could point to. All nationalists, of course, have a golden era. <laughs> they look back to a golden era when their entire max, maximalist nationalist position had been achieved. It's the problem in the Balkans. Everybody's golden era conflicts with everybody else's golden era. And so what kind of, what, what kind of group, or, you know, what, what kind of Ukraine would come out of that? Probably most complex of all the regions where the Germans recruited fighters for their side was the situation in the Caucasus. And in some sense, this is Stalin's greatest weakness, his greatest vulnerability. He's Georgian. He's from there. He's always purported to understand the Cauc Caucasian peoples, Caucasian as in inhabitants of the Caucasus, not the way we use it. Um, he's always purported to have some special bond with the non-Russian nationalities of the Soviet Union. As you may, may know, Stalin is his, is his stage name. It's his, it's his pseudonym. He's Joseph Jugashvili, you know, classic Georgian name. And here, you know, the, 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 the Caucasian peoples are flocking en masse to the German border. But it would be impossible for each of them to become independent and to achieve their maximal position, the territories they claim. And of course, We've seen that play out in the Balkans since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Exactly. Do, who does own Nagorno-Karabakh? You know, it's a good question. And people died over it in great numbers in the last 20 or 25 years. So, so Jen, the, I, I, um, when you say, yeah, millions of people flock to the Nazis, that doesn't necessarily translate into military advantage or a, uh, what's the word? A, um, a logical political position or a cohesive political position. It's a lot of individuals. And frankly, uh, since this is happening within the context of, of Nazi conquest, the, the world's greatest you know, racist <laughs> of all time, who, who only thinks really Aryan or the Nordic peoples have any capability of rule. Hitler doesn't really, you know, Hitler get the Kalmyks support Hitler. The Kalmyks are an Asian people and related to the original Mongol invasion of, of, of Eurasia. Um, you know, they're not exactly, they don't look like the Aryan Superman stereotype that Hitler has in mind when he thinks of a master race, a, a heron folk. So um, I, the Nazis were never able to make much of this. And people who say, and Jen, you've heard this as a Ukrainian scholar, well, if the Ukrainians first greeted Hitler, you know, bread and salt in the villages, or visited, or, I should say this, greeted the German conquerors who were overthrowing Stalinism, not greeted Hitler. Um, and, you know, and bread and salt, a traditional gathering, or a traditional gifts that the uh, village people give you. And people say, my students used to say this all the time, boy, if, if Hitler only could have, you know, harnessed that, anti, that, 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 that sort of anti-Stalinist feeling and worked with the subject nationalities of the Soviet Union, he might have won the war. Well, you know, pigs could fly. I mean, if Hitler, if Hitler suddenly turned into a cosmopolitan who understood and valued separate cultures, then he never would have started the war in the first place or gone into politics or did the horrible things he'd done. So, I, 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 you know, this, if only Hitler were more reasonable, <laughs> he might have won World War II, but then he never would have launched it. So it's, it's a non-issue. Thank you. Um, and Alex. <laughs>
I mean, it's a very, very good point. No, thank you. <laughs> um, so you mentioned, um, I really liked when you were talking about the um, lesser known aspects of resistance, like speaking Polish um, in secret, um, certain graffitis that were drawn, um, and then like secret underground um, networks. I'm wondering if, do any of these like more secretive resistance acts happen after the war ended and communism takes over yeah. in Poland? Yes, absolutely. The, uh, the, uh, the, the organization, the way in which uh, the AK operated was they were both anti-Nazi and anti-Soviet, generally speaking. The Poles, as you know, um, didn't want to be dictated from, from Berlin, but nor did they want to be dictated from, from Moscow. And, and, and there, there, were, there were elements um, called the lost soldiers who actually continued to fight against the Soviets, and some for five or six years. And in fact, the Soviets were very much against this, and they started to round up anybody who was in the Aka, the Polish Home Army, that they could identify. Uh, they started to fight um, in 1944. They started to fight with the Soviets to try and retake places like Lvov for Lviv now and uh, um, uh, Vilnius and places like that. Um, and uh, as soon as they had uh, recaptured the city, there was a lot of sort of drinking and dancing around amongst the soldiers themselves, but then the NKVD would show up and arrest the Polish Home Army guys. And it went around very quickly that the Soviets were just as much our enemies as the, as the Nazis were, and that we have to fight. Now there was a, uh, after the war was over, there was an amnesty for people who were in the Home Army and Stalin uh, offered them to come forward and, and declare that they'd been in the Home Army. Um, at some point, some of those did and were then promptly arrested. Um, but there was an amnesty that also worked, but there were also uh, Home Army soldiers and others who just said, that's it, we're not gonna give up to the Soviets and they continued to fight on and on and on. The Soviets were also incredibly brutal to the, to the Home Army and anybody that they suspected of possibly carrying on resistance. Uh, what happened to them, including my father and I had been in the Home Army, was put into Stalinist prison for seven years. And one of the worst punishments for him and others in the, um, uh, in the prison, the Rakovetsky prison in Warsaw, was that they were put in prison with uh, Nazi criminals. So his friend uh, uh, Motarski uh, was put in pris prison with Jürgen Stroop, who'd been mm. in charge of crushing the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, my father-in-law was put in, in prison with a couple of SS criminals. And that's the sort of humiliation of, of, of the AK. They were, and in the prison hierarchy, they were the lowest of the low, the AK people. The Nazis got privileges and were able to do all sorts of things that the, that the Polish Home Army guys weren't. And there were some very famous um, uh, Polish Home Army people um, uh, uh, Neil, uh, I won't get Pildorf and uh, various others who were actually killed, including uh, Pilecki, who I mentioned, uh, Vitol Pilecki, who had gotten himself into Auschwitz. These people were just simply murdered by the Soviets in these prisons. So yes, the, the resistance did carry on. The Poles were absolutely furious that they'd, that they'd been you know, pushed from one dictatorship to another. And uh, unlike, you were mentioning Belarus and other countries and areas in, in, uh, that were under the Soviets earlier, uh, Poland did have a very clearly defined sense of its national identity. It had been a hugely important empire in the Renaissance period, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. It, it, it was, uh, had a very clear sense of, of uh, not only linguistically religious and so on identity, but just the whole sense of its, of its importance in history. And so um, both the, uh, the Germans and the Soviets had quite a, a job ahead of them trying to crush that out of existence. You know, if, I, if I may, on, on Poland, of course, Poland had been under German occupation for the entire 19th century and under Russian occupation, Austrian occupation, very restive population. I mean, if you ask the Germans how easy it was to rule their Polish-speaking areas in yeah. the 19th century, yeah. Bismarck, for example, yeah, exactly. would give you a long talk. Yes, exactly. And as I said, the whole underground operation organization started in the, it's from 1772, when, when, the, when the, exactly the Prussians said, no, you can't speak Polish, and they said, oh, yes, we can. The Russians did the same thing, and those big citadels and, and the oppressive sort of, uh, you know, when there were all the uprisings that took place in the, in the Russian sector, they just built, you know, even more monstrous prisons and more monstrous systems of repression, which just, in turn, led to an 1863 uprising and right. so on. And it was very, very difficult to control the Poles precisely because of their deep, deep sense of, of their, their national identity. Yeah, that kind of leads me into um, my final question, and this is for both of you. Um, I was wondering if you could both talk about how the Cold War shaped the way these resistance movements were remembered, and then also how did that memory change after the end of the Cold War? Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a profound question. There's so many different levels. The, 
a rest of Ukraine in, in the 1950s or 60s was, was a danger to global stability. It was a danger to the Soviet Union, clearly. It was a danger to the United States. It could have, a revolt in Ukraine could have triggered World War III. And despite the fact that, uh, that America and the Western Alliance was you know, beaming in Radio Free Europe broadcasts, when it came down to it, there was almost no support given. I'm, I'm thinking of all the broadcasts into Czechoslovakia in 1968, you know, uh, uh, supporting the so-called Prague Spring, the Czech Spring, which was liberalizing the country. And when there was an actual uh, uh, uprising, you know, there was very little support from the West. Uh, actually, probably should have gone back to Hungary in 1956 and started there, because there was a Radio Free Europe kind of encouraging the, the Magyars, the Hungarians, to rise up against their Soviet overlords. And then when they did, it was just sat back and watched Soviet tanks roll in and and, and crush the place. So, you know, there, were, there was a big uprising in East Berlin, East Germany, but East Berlin primarily in 1953. 1956, there was a whole slew of them across the countryside, Poland, across the, across the continent, uh, Poland, uh, Hungary. In 1968, more uh, as formation of solidarity in, in, the, in the 1980s. So, you know, the, 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 re the rest of nature of the subject populations of the Soviet Union were there from the beginning. And there was a lot of loose talk occasionally emanating from Washington that, you know, well, maybe we can make some play out of this. But, but boy, making play out of something when, when, when hydrogen uh, uh, bomb, you know, missile, hydrogen tip bomb missiles are, are aimed at one another, and you could have literally a push button war that would end civilization when, when the mil American military establishment is carrying out exercises, operations like. Operation Broiler and Operation Drop Shot to, to drop three or four hundred missiles on the Soviet Union in the, end, in the event of a new war, and the Soviets probably planning something similar. So I think that's what the Cold War did. It tamped it down, and for years I came up in the air when we heard, you know, nationalism. <laughs> Nationalism's old school. Nobody cares anymore. This is a, about capitalism or, or free market democracy versus communism. But of course, that was a lie. Both sides said it. I think both sides probably knew it was a lie, but, but both sides were also deathly afraid of triggering World War III. So again, the, the Polish situation is, is quite, quite interesting because um, really sort of their Polish nation was behind the underground, the underground, they were loyal to the Polish army in exile in London. Uh, and um, this was really the population. There was a teeny tiny group of uh, communist uh, uh, resistance fighters, but it was, was minute. It's different, for example, if you look at the resistance in places like France or you know, Spain, whatever, where you've got almost a civil war going on, which emerges after the war in these hostile, you know, you did this, I did that. But in Poland, it was very unified resistance, generally speaking. And, um, and so after the war, uh, the Soviets, of course, tried to make much of the tiny Soviet uh, resistance fighters, but the Poles would have none of it. Of course, it was tremendous repression, secret police, everything else, and you weren't allowed to openly talk about the, the Home Army, what they did. Of course, you were arrested if you were obviously a member of the Home Army, uh, and so that, that history was pushed underground. But because so many people had participated in it, that history just went underground. And, and so, so, for example, so many people that I, I knew even before, when I was going to Poland before the collapse of communism, on the 1st of August, there was always a commemoration in the Poland Cemetery. Well, what can you do if you're a Soviet secret police? You, you can't really stop people from going to the cemetery. So they would go very quietly, commemorate the young uh, Boy Scouts, for example, who died in, 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 in the, the Warsaw Uprising. And sort of difficult to stop that. And that carried on and carried on. And, and there were, of course, there was a, a, a writing about the uprising and so on in the AK abroad. Uh, and then there was this sort of quiet understanding of who was who and what was what and, and who'd participated. It was a, it's very, very, was very clear as a sort of underground society in Poland. Um, and then, of course, uh, as um, Rob was saying, there were all outbursts of, of various uprisings and so on that happened in Poland, including uh, in the Gdansk um, shipyards that, that, that were then commemorated when Solidarity got going and Lech Wałęsa, uh, you know, created again using this sort of underground state that, uh, that, that came together again to create Solidarity, which again swept over the country and led very much to the collapse of communism. The point, appointment of John Paul II coming to Poland very much helped and many other symbolic uh, things as well, including the political constellations of Gorbachev, Reagan, Helmut Kohl and Margaret Thatcher and others. Um, but nevertheless, the, the, uh, the 
the sense, even in the Cold War, even when they were trying to repress this history, was that uh, even if it was a little flicker of flame, that people understood there'd been an uprising, they understood there was a home army, they understood right from wrong, they understood they didn't want to be under the Soviet yoke, and the minute they had the chance to get rid of the Soviets, they did. That's good. Great, thank you. So I will now turn it over to my colleague, Jeremy Collins, um, who will be doing the audience Q&A. Thank you to Jen, Rob, and Alex for a great conversation. <laughs> We're gonna start to your right. Uh, I'm gonna direct this question to Dr. Ritchie. Uh, I'd like you to comment on Joseph Stalin's involvement in the Warsaw Uprising. Just before the Warsaw Uprising, the Russians had pushed back the German army to near the outskirts of Warsaw. And according to one side of the story, uh, Stalin cynically told the Polish Home Army, it's time to rise up, and then held his troops back while the remaining uh, Nazis wiped them out. On the other hand, the Germans had just, I'm sorry, the Russians had just finished a massive operation and it was a natural stopping point to resupply, reorganize, and it was just bad timing for the Polish Home Army. So I'd, I'd like to hear what you have to say about it. Well, part of, I agree with part of, part of what you say and disagree with another part. The, um, so what really, uh, went on was that, yes, the, the, uh, the end of Bagration, the, the Soviets are pushing toward Warsaw, the, um, the Poles want to make sure that, as they said, they can liberate uh, Poland, uh, Warsaw of the Germans, and greet the Soviets in, as sort of fellow liberators. And they were, uh, they thought they might do this quite easily because of Bagration. I mean, for, for weeks they'd seen uh, German troops bedraggled, you know, barefoot, without weapons and stuff, you know, trudging through Warsaw on their way west. And the Poles made the mistake that they thought that the German army was finished. Of course, as we all know, the war went on for quite a long, longer and then very bloody and violently, and the Germans were by no means finished. Um, and it is indeed true that the Soviets were getting very, very close to Warsaw, but what they didn't count on, and this is the, the, the real detail that so matters, was that Walter Model, one of Hitler's ablest generals, was managed to coddle together. Uh, uh, he was appointed in June when Bagration was obviously becoming evident that it was so such a rout. Uh, he gets the Hermann Goering division from Italy, he gets 19th Panzer, he gets uh, Viking SS from Holland, he gets uh, a Totenkopf, um, and various other groups, he coddles them together. And just by fluke, it wasn't planned, it was just where they happened to be, uh, where he happens to be able to counterattack. They uh, counterattack just outside of Warsaw, in the, between the towns of Volmen and Radzimin. Radzimin, of course, famous for the 1920s miracle on the Vistula. So that's where wars always happen. So they slam into them and they give the uh, Third Tank's army a, a bloody nose. They stop them in their tracks, but just for a, a while. Stalin could have could have carried on. But the uprising starts on the 1st of August, and Stalin, uh, Mikhailovich, Mikhailovich, the, the uh, prime minister of the Home Army and uh, the uh, governor in exile in London, is in Moscow at that point when Stalin learns about the uprising. And Stalin is furious and says it's sort of a criminal event, et cetera, et cetera. And as, as the events in, the, in Warsaw unfold, um, and, and Stalin realizes the Germans are going to fight back, they're not just going to run away, he says to himself, you know, I mean, why should I go in? You know, he could have. There's absolutely no truth to the fact that Stalin couldn't have uh, uh, gone forward, and in fact, a number of his generals push him to do so. Um, but he says, no, why should I go in when the, when the Nazis are fighting against the very people I despise, the Polish Home Army uh, representatives of gov government exile in London, the nationalist Poles, um, you know, they're all exposing themselves to this German route. Why should, we po why should I? Bother. So yes, very cynically then, Stalin sits on the other side of the Vistula River as Warsaw is, is crushed in the most vicious way. You know, the, the black Saturdays, 30,000 Poles are killed in, in one, one day in the Vola uh, uprising, Vola massacre. People like um, Derle, the Derlevanger Brigade, one of the nastiest groups ever to come out of the SS, which is saying something, <laughs> uh, you know, turns against the civilian population of Warsaw. And Stalin watches it until, until the capitulation, that's true. 
but, uh, but the, the one element that's often not included in this, especially from the Polish version, is, is, that, is that Stalin did encounter serious military resistance at the beginning of the, just the, the night before the uprising begins, uh, uh, just on the outskirts of Warsaw, which did stop them militarily for a time. No, I'm, uh, I just can't really let any comment on Stalin go by without just reminding everyone he comes from a place of paranoia. He looked at this uprising in, in Warsaw and concocted some kind of Western plot, yeah. which was going to put the London government back into power. None of those things are true. It really was a, it was a homegrown uprising. But mm -hmm. you, you, you always, just every time you think of Stalin, let the word paranoia kind of soak in around your mind a while, and maybe you'll be able to understand some more of his, uh, more of his decisions. And I'm going to let you all know that we'll hear much more about the uprising and the Polish Home Army when one of our guests, Dr. Anthony Krzyzewski, will be speaking tomorrow afternoon. Anthony, could you please stand up and wave? Please stand up and just... <laughs> Next question is going to be in the center here. Dr. Ritchie, question on the resistance. Um, as we know, in Western Europe, uh, the British and, and later the Americans actively supported resistance in France, Belgium, Holland, and other places. Were they able to give any assistance to this very uh, mature resistance organization in Poland? And if so, was it effective? And how did they do that? Absolutely. The, uh, the British were involved with the Polish resistance from the beginning. I mentioned the SOE, the Chief Chemny, the, the Silent and Unseen, who were trained. Uh, by the by the SOE and dropped into Poland. Uh, the Polish branch of uh, the SOE was very active, um, and there were all sorts of co collaborations. So, for example, the creation of a radio station that was that they pretended was based in Poland was actually in England, uh, broadcasting to Poland. The Germans were running around trying to find this radio station all the time. This was a British. British uh, invention, effectively, and there were many, many other examples of, the, of that as well. For the uprising itself, however, it was it was a little bit complicated because um, it was very, very difficult. The, the, of course, the Poles wanted to supply the the uprising. The Polish Polish uh, troops in exile wanted to supply the uprising, but the flights had to come in either from Britain, which was very risky, or from Brindisi. Uh, and uh, although Churchill was trying to, to, to push Stalin, Stalin refused to allow uh, Western Allied planes to fly behind um, the Soviet lines to refuel. And so this was a huge problem. So even though Churchill was, you know, was in the House of Commons saying, we need to help the Poles, we need to do something to help, uh, Stalin in that, in that point was probably the most perfidious thing he did at that point was, was to not allow even Western Allied help by stopping the refueling. And there were many other examples of, of these sorts of problems uh, between the Soviets and the Western Allies already emerging. And the Warsaw Uprising was one of the things that really started to kind of be a fore, uh, harbinger of the Cold War. Next question is going to be in the back to your left panelists with Connie. Um, Alex, could you comment about um, the relationships between um, Jewel, Jews and Poles in the Polish resistance? And then you also mentioned um, Jan Karski, and I think it's interesting that the sense of his mission to London and Washington in 1943 has come to be interpreted as primarily an effort to alert uh, Churchill and Roosevelt about the destruction of the Jews. And there's been some research recently suggesting that that wasn't really the primary purpose of that mission. That is not to downplay his heroism or bravery, but it's how that episode has been sort of reinterpreted in the light of more recent history. Uh, a hu huge question for a whole seminar mm -hmm. uh, to them. Uh, the, the, first, the relationship the, the between, between the Jews and the Poles. The Poles. Yeah. Very, very. So just, to, just, to, I mean, uh, very, very complicated question. Just to say quickly that, of course, the relationship between Jews, Polish Jews, and, and the Poles, Polish Catholics, was very, very complex anyway. Uh, and uh, when, the, when the Nazis invaded, I'm not going to talk about the Soviet zone, which had its own issues, but the Nazis very deliberately separated Polish, Polish society from Polish Jewish society, creating the ghettos and so on, uh, which is why the P Polish Jewish resistance was, uh, as I, I mentioned, Ringelblum, and I mentioned Zub and other organizations that were that were really to do with Polish resistance. Um, the Akka did have Jewish members in it. There were elements of the Akka that were terribly anti-Semitic. 
um, and, and notoriously so. Uh, and then there were elements of the ACA, I mentioned Kedif and other organizations which were which worked very closely together with Jews uh, and, and organizations like Zygota on which there were two representatives of the Polish Jewish community in this uh, organization set up by the Polish um, government in exile to help uh, give aid to Jews, particularly after the, uh, the Gross Aktion started in uh, 1942. So, so there, it's a very, very complex question. Um, as for Jan Karski, I agree with you, this wasn't the only thing, the only purpose of his mission, but perhaps in hindsight, with historical uh, sort of the, the, the grace of hindsight, we are able to see the, the, the gravity, the importance, the tragedy of the Holocaust, and, and looking for sort of anybody, people who tried to do something. Um, and, and Karski was one of those people. Yes, he talked about a great many other things as well when he went on his career missions, uh, the, the state of the front, the, the state of supply lines between Germany and the front, and the, the, the state of the Soviet, uh, the Red Army, and all these other, he talked about many, many other things. But the, but the fact that he tried to go to, to Roosevelt, he, he went famously to Felix Frankfurter, the Chief Justice, who was also Jewish, and he said, this is what's happening to the Jews in Poland. And the scale of it was just astronomical by this point. And um, Frankfurter said, uh, it's not that I uh, say you're lying, it's just that I don't believe you. And, and so it was so this difficulty of trying to, trying to you know, shake the shoulders of the rest of the world and say, you know, this is what's happening. Um, and there were all sorts of things, about, well, you're exaggerating, you know, Belgian babies in First World War, this kind of thing. And so people didn't, realize what was happening and really until after the war. In the back to your right, please. Uh, thank you for Dr. Ritchie. Um, I grew up in uh, New Britain, Connecticut, and uh, in the 1950s, I went to elementary school with um, half of our school, Catholic school, were uh, children uh, immigrating from Poland uh, in Connecticut. And a good friend of mine who I also went to school has sent me this very powerful book Irena's Children, and if, uh, I highly recommend this book to everyone in the group here. It's a very uh, moving and powerful story of how this, this, the individuals, as so many of our speakers talk about, on their own saved, uh, I think, two to 3,000 uh, Jewish children uh, and out of the Warsaw uh, ghetto. And I wondered whether you had ever had any opportunity to, uh, to meet her or to get exposed to her group, but, and also, it was also interesting, your comment about pushing history underground, is that so many of these stories didn't come out because while the Soviets were there, it was dangerous for people like Irina and others to be, to even have the public know, the, the Soviets know about their bravery during the war. Yes, I, I know about Irina Sendler very well. My father-in-law was one of the co-founders of the group uh, Zygota, and she was head of the children's section, so she was responsible for uh, largely what she did was to organize uh, getting uh, children out of the ghetto and very largely getting them into Catholic um, monasteries or getting them into uh, you know seminaries or whatever so that they could uh, be sort of hidden uh, with um, Gentile children, learn how to pray and so on when the Nazis, which they frequently did, came to, to see if there were Jews hiding amongst the children that they could be hidden because they had learned how to behave uh, like good Polish Catholics. Um, yes, it's a fantastically interesting story and again, um, was of course well known in Poland but was only relatively recently uh, became known in the in the West, uh, but the organization Zygota, as I mentioned earlier, there were uh, Adolf Berman and um, uh, Feiner, they were both Jewish representatives who had actually been in the ghetto, came out, lived on the Aryan side, and co cooperated with uh, with people like Bartoszewski and others who worked uh, to create this organization uh, to save the Jews, and and uh, they did manage to save. Well, they aided tens of thousands of people, but unfortunately, of course, um, as my father-in-law said, the most terrible thing was that you'd get somebody you know, almost to the end of the war, and then they'd be denounced by somebody, or they'd be caught by the Gestapo, and, and all that work of months and years of trying to hide somebody was, was in, in vain. But it was an extraordinary and a unique organization in Europe, in, which was set up in Poland, um, to, to save and aid the, the Jews of Poland. Next question is in the back to your left, please. Hi, I got a question for uh, Dr. Satino. Um, how did the atrocities committed by the Einsatz group and 
um, affect Soviet uh, revolutionary activity? And like, did it increase it, or did it decrease it, or was it negligible? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the, the Einsatzgruppen were not created to, to restore order in the rear areas. You know, the, their, their job was to, was to kill the Jewish population and any other, anybody else who was targeted. So that could be commissars, or individual local dignitaries, but essentially the purpose of the Einsatzgruppen was to, was to kill Jews. Certainly as part of a, a spectrum of oppressive German occupation tactics, it, we can say the Einsatzgruppen had you know, something to do with the large number of Soviet citizens who were willing to go into resistance against German occupation. I gave them short shrift at the beginning of my talk, but, but the, the, you know, there's another several million people who decided in some way, even though they, weren't, they were no longer in the army, to keep resisting the Germans. So as part of a spectrum of, 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 of oppressive German tactics, I, I think we can say the Einsatzgruppen probably had something to do with that. But, but, but I, I think more importantly to the sort of the shape of the resistance in German-occupied Soviet Union were things like food policies, uh, in which essentially the Germans, German occupation in the Soviet Union, and, and maybe even, we, we could talk to our Asian specialists about this too, it was, it was a kind of colonial policy, which was treating the Soviet Union as a gigantic, I don't know, India, or gigantic Dutch, version of the Dutch East Indies, uh, grabbing everything that wasn't nailed down, so to speak, but especially foodstuffs and raw materials, and extracting them for the German war machine. Now, when you extract all the food out of, out of Ukraine, that doesn't leave anything for, for the Ukrainians to eat. And so I think, while I, I'd like to say that the murder of the Jews, the Judeo side on the Eastern Front, was the real cause for, for resistance against the Germans, it certainly was in some cases, and there are Jewish partisan groups, so there it would be directly. But I think for the most part, it was just the horribly oppressive nature of, of German rule in the Soviet Union. The German operational plan for the, for the war in the Soviet Union assumed that, that 25 to 30 to 40 million Soviet citizens would, would starve to death in the first winter of the occupation as everything that could be extracted out of the Soviet Union was brought back to Germany or to greater Germany now, this big, large, enlarged Germany in the center of the, in the, center of the continent. I mean, that wasn't, so, boy, the Germans. But I wonder if they knew that was going to happen. Well, they thought, they, they wrote it down. They, 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 they did say it was, it was going to be expected. Um, you, know, you said slavery. But what were the Germans going to do with their, with their uh, t uh, subject uh, populations? Is it slavery? It's more, it's more like ancient Spartan heloths, or, or uh, feudalism doesn't even go far enough, because a serf living in, in medieval Europe would probably have a lot better than a Soviet citizen in occupied uh, German territory. But deliberate starvation, it was just, it was part of the plan, and I think that had a lot more to do with it. And, and by the second, you know, it was supposed, campaign supposed to be over in six weeks, or something, by the second campaigning season, the Germans had realized that, and and did try to modify their extractive economic policies in, in the occupied Soviet Union in the hopes of recruiting more auxiliary volunteers, which they clearly did in 1942. It was usually seen, but at the time, we don't really give the, we don't say this is a success nowadays, but as the Germans surveyed their, their occupation policies in the Soviet Union, they felt they had made a real breakthrough in, in 1942 by getting to, to, to a point where at least enough people were being fed that many were willing to volunteer for work with the German forces. We have time for one, maybe two questions left. That's We're going to go halfway back to your left, please. Dr. Ritchie, I remember you saying last year that we should learn more about Eastern European history. So I attended a lecture by Zoom with Dr. Timothy Snyder from Yale. Yeah, there you go. And he said, to my surprise, that the World War II in Europe was fought mainly over the Ukraine between Hitler and Stalin. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Also, Ukrainian resistance against the Nazis and against, then against the Soviets. And is what's going on now in Ukraine of just an extension of uh, World War II resistance against <laughs> oppressors. I'll let you handle that one, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just, um, again, another seminar, let's say. Uh, no, just, I mean, Tim Snyder's absolutely amazing, fantastic scholar, and he, he, he's one of the first in his, in his groundbreaking book, Bloodlands, which I recommend to anybody to read, and his other work as well, uh, points out that 
Um, first of all, his main thesis, I suppose, is that, uh, put very generally, that this is a war of annihilation in the East, particularly Central Eastern Europe, uh, and indeed largely Ukraine, but it also encom encompasses other areas as well. And that, um, and that it's also, I mean, it, it, not only a war of annihilation, but that the World War II, unlike what we learn in our school books, uh, in terms of in Hitler's mind, certainly was really nothing to do with the Normandy landings or or North Africa, whatever. His war really was a war of uh, colonization, of extermination, of of taking over uh, what he considered to be uh, Lebensraum, living space, uh, what he considered to be Ur German lands in the east. And Rob was talking about some of these things, the Generalplan Ost, you know, this idea that you were just going to take over everything uh, up to uh, the Urals um, and kill the Jewish population, enslave and kill a lot of the Slavic population. Rob was mentioning Eric von der Bach Zaleski, who turns witness for the prosecution at Nuremberg, ca casually says 12 million people will die the first winter. We are expecting about 40 million to die of starvation. And there were already plans, as Rob mentioned, put in place. You were not allowed to give a piece of bread to one of these people in these hunger zones, or you too would be killed. This was their future plan. This was the lovely plan for the German uh, occupation of the East. St. Petersburg was to be destroyed. Um, um, Moscow was to be destroyed, Minsk was to be leveled and called Asgard, and all these places were to be turned into nice little German towns, hamlets, with German uh, Germans, you know, having their nice little goots, their nice little um, uh, kind of manor houses. And then the re remaining Slavic population that hadn't been bumped off by starvation were going to be basically allowed to be educated to count up to about 100 and learn a few letters and, and numbers so they'd be useful as farmhands and so on. And that was the German plan for the East and the war. And Hitler's focus really was on the uh, Eastern Front. And Ukraine, of course, as Schneider points out, is, is really the crux of that, of, that, uh, of that war. And of course, it, it does carry on into the, into the politics for today, because you cannot, you cannot have a, a war of such brutality and violence then followed by Soviet occupation and moving of borders and all of the things that have gone on since the war, uh, and then expect that somehow every, everything's going to resolve itself and be wonderful and peaceful. It's too much history. If I can just make one comment about that linkage, Dr. Mike, between World War II and, and the present day. Putin's uh, official, at least, explanation for the invasion of Ukraine was that fascists were coming to power in Ukraine or were already in power. These are the same people who resisted, who, who, who collaborated with the Germans and, re, and resisted Soviet rule, and, and now they are the sort of the spearhead of a fascist counteroffensive. It's patently absurd. I mean, I'll just say that. I, I will say that. It's patently absurd, but nevertheless, it's what he said. He's, he has said much the same sort of thing about various ruling circles in the Baltic states, uh, that, that these are actually kind of fascist bridgeheads against Russia, and, and who knows what action might be taken. Hopefully he's you know, learned some sort of lesson by this debacle that he's overseen in the, uh, in the invasion of Ukraine. But right now he's sitting back and pummeling Ukraine. The rain of missiles, unlike anybody's seen anywhere, I think, since World War II, but, but the ostensible purpose of this war is to smash fascism. So at least in Putin's fevered brain, maybe World War II is still going on in some way. We're going to extend time for one final question here. Um, my question is for Dr. Satino. Um, did the Roosevelt oh. administration know about the resistance forces uh, fighting the Russians, uh, fighting the, uh, the, the Russians on the side of the Germans? And if they did, did they view these as, uh, as patriots trying to liberate their own country, or did they view them as kind of flies in the ointment of the bigger picture to uh, yeah, kill off uh, all the Nazis? Of the above. Uh, no, they, they did not, view, they viewed them as collaborators. They viewed them through the, the same lens that all members of the Allied camp were. If you're fighting on behalf of the Germans, then you're, you know, collaboration used to be a perfectly benign English noun that now took on this sinister overtone, which meant helping, you know, working with the, working with the Nazis. Um, trying to get, you know, there was no question of giving them any kind of assistance. They were fighting against Stalin. They were obviously helping Otto Hitler in some cases. When they did, when individuals did fall into Western hands at the end of the war, many of these East European uh, Waffen SS commanders and whatnot tried to flee to the West to, you know, to, to get taken prisoner by the Americans. They were often handed back over to the, to the NKVD or to the Red Army or to, the, to, to, to Stalin in, in some way. So I, I think our State Department was reasonably well informed of the complexities of East European politics. And, and that reflects domestic policy in America. I've, many of you know I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio, where there are many polyglot ethnic groups all living together. 
Yalta Day in Cleveland, Ohio is like a national day of mourning. And all the, all these, uh, all the uh, Latvians and uh, Lithuanians and Estonians and Slovenians and all the other uh, Poles, all the other ethnic groups, you know, kind of uh, uh, mourning the day of Yalta. Uh, so there's domestic policy involved there, but, but even if, no, no one in the State Department is thinking this, this would be a good way to help overthrow Stalinism. We had enough trouble trying to overthrow Hitler. And just to, to add that it, it, it sometimes was, was uh, absolutely justified to think that way because if you're looking at somebody like the Kaminsky Brigade and Rona, who were basically total collaborators with the Germans sure. fighting against sure. the Russians, and yeah. he wanted to create a, a sort of separate Russian state, and as the Red Army moved, he just, he just went and joined, the, uh, joined von den Barsalewski to kill civilians. Um, but you had a much more complicated case with the Vlasov Army, for example, which was also dismissed by the United States, but it was a much, much more complex organization and its aims were much more complex. So it depends on which resistance group you were looking at. But the, the State Department just didn't differentiate. And at the end of the war, as Rob said, a lot of these people who, who actually were genuinely um, both against Stalin and Kent Sittler were handed over um, under the great sort of label of, of collaborators, asked by Stalin, by the way, asked for by Stalin. Ladies and gentlemen, Jennifer Popowitz, Rob Satino, and Alex Ritchie. Beautiful session. Beautiful session. Thank you.